Um, yeah, here we are. We are right at the one o'clock hour. And so because we want to respect everyone's time, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so today you are here uh, at a Get Connected by Galaxy Digital webinar um, all about how building a relational volunteer culture can maximize impact. Um, so I want to let you know if you do need to use closed captioning, that is available for you at the bottom. And um, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Court, and I work here at Get Connected by Galaxy Digital in creative communications and outreach. If you're not familiar with us, Get Connected is our best-in-class volunteer management software serving thousands of organizations across North America. And it's designed specifically to meet the needs of volunteer managers and their programs. Um, so today we've got our special panel featuring Elizabeth Donovan. Elizabeth's head of our Get Connected Network team. And Elizabeth brings her years of experience working with nonprofits as well as state organizations to connect communities through technology and relationships. And we're incredibly excited to welcome Laurel Fisher and Dana Story of Fisher Story Consulting. Uh, Fisher Story Consulting provides innovative social impact solutions for mission-driven organizations and businesses. Um, Laurel Fisher is a nonprofit specialist with over 20 years of experience working in fundraising, grants management, social enterprise, data collection, impact measurement, and nonprofit training. And Dana Story is a nonprofit profit professional with over 18 years of experience in the nonprofit and social enterprise space, specializing in fundraising, grant writing, project and event management, board development, and communication strategy. Um, so really, really excited to have uh, Dana and Laurel with us today as our special guests here. And we'll also have AK Diefenbach, one of the regional managers from our Get Connected Network team, joining us to manage that chat box where you can ask questions and share ideas. AK comes from a background in working with an affordable housing nonprofit and volunteer management, and now works here uh, with our Get Connected Network to build relationships between our organizations. So we'll all work together to keep this space like really healthy, really respectful. We've got folks who are brand new to volunteer management and those who've been doing it for a while. Um, so just know that you know we're all keep keeping this space together um, just to make it an uplifting experience for everyone. And um, use that chat box to really communicate, ask questions, and share ideas. And with that, I will move into sharing our slides. All right. So today we've got how building a relational volunteer culture can maximize impact. So what we'll cover today is number one, improve the quality of your volunteer program with a relational volunteer culture, to increase the number of volunteers and the level of engagement among volunteers through relationship-based culture, and how to use that success to enhance other areas of your organization's work. So make sure you stay to the end for practical tips, keeping program morale high by acknowledging and appreciating volunteers. Um, that'll include reducing apathy and frustration among volunteers and staff how to make your volunteers feel valued, and ways to appreciate volunteers without breaking the bank. That is something that I know we're all thinking about. So I'm going to, with that, go ahead and pitch it over to uh, Laurel and Dana to share with us just a little bit um, about their work so that we can just understand a little bit more of their perspective. Absolutely. Thanks for having us today, Court. And Elizabeth and AK, we're so delighted to be with you all today. Uh, yes, we are Fisher Story Consulting. Uh, we're based in Nashville, Tennessee, but we have experience in working in nonprofits both across the state of Tennessee, but also across the country and even the world since Dana spent some time in East Africa uh, doing some work there. Um, but we are very interested in helping nonprofits identify those trouble spots. What's holding you back? What's keeping you from reaching your mission, vision, um, and the impact that you want to see in your area of focus? And so we work with organizations to figure out what, what that barrier is and try and figure out ways to address that. So we do that through a variety of different ways that you've 
can see on the slide here. We do one-on-one -on -one coaching with leaders. We also do projects where we'll do an assessment project or even some ongoing coaching services that can be done on a monthly basis. So we work with a lot of uh, small organizations all the way to big organizations with uh, large large million dollar budgets um, uh, but we're so delighted to do the work that we do we just want to empower every everyone we work with to be the best they can be i know one of the things that you said the other day too is that um you really focus on you know a holistic view and yes. um I feel like that is so integral to what it is we're talking about today. Um, so let's just kind of dive right in here. Um, Elizabeth, why don't you go ahead and, and take it away on what does it really mean to have a relational volunteer culture? Because I feel like we're talking about something that's somewhat intangible. It's a little bit of a feeling, but how can we identify it? Yeah, it's an accord always, which is like a definition to ground us. So a relational volunteer culture is personal. It's supportive, collaborative. Relational volunteer culture results in deeper, more meaningful connections between volunteers, the organization, and the mission. And I think, you know, as we think about this slide, I'm going to pass it back over to, to you, Laurel and Dana, but that moment of reciprocal came up when we were thinking about this earlier. And like, how does a relation be reciprocal in a way that the volunteer is seeing something, the project's getting something, the nonprofit's getting something, and how you keep having to weigh the balance to make sure that sometimes it's not reciprocal. And how do you even bring that to light? That this isn't going to work unless we figure out a way to have meaning for both of us. So yeah, love to have yeah. you guys talk more about that. Yeah, yeah. It's it's definitely a different way of looking at things. Um, uh, you know, nonprofits are regularly asked to provide numbers and data to prove their, their impact in the community. Uh, a lot of times uh, we need both those quantitative and qualitative data measurements. And so uh, when we look at volunteer culture with the qualitative lens, that's where that reciprocity comes in. Because if without it, it is just checking a box and nobody wants to just check a box. I mean, none of us are in the nonprofit sector because we wanted to check a box. We would have been in a much different industry if that were the case. Um, and so uh, volunteers are just so integral to making your mission and vision come to fruition. I didn't even mean to rhyme all of that, but it worked just fine. Uh, so, so we need to find ways for them to feel valued in it, for them to understand the role they're playing in the overall goal of the organization. And that has ramifications throughout the organization. Would you add anything to that, Dana? No, I would, I would agree. And I think just after, you know, all the, the different nonprofits that we've worked in over the years, um, I think there really is quite a, uh, you can see quite a difference um, in the organizations that focus on building relationships with their volunteers and just even being relational throughout their entire organizational culture, whether that's with their donors or their staff, um, just really kind of creating <clears throat> excuse me, that re relational culture permeating throughout the, the organization. And um, it, it can be difficult because, you know, nonprofits that you're asked to be all, all things to all people and wear all the hats and, you, you know, in different, uh, you're a volunteer coordinator, but then you're also in communications or development and this and that. So um, it can be hard to create that relational um, culture but if you if you are able to, it is really very valuable, um, and we've seen just the 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 incredible impact that it can make within the organization and then the community and the mission of the organization. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the words that jump out to me on this on this are supportive and collaborative. Um, you might not recognize it when when they're there. You might think, oh, this is great. But when they're not there, you can feel it, even if you can't quite put your finger on what it is. And I, I feel like I've 
probably been in that situation a couple of times. So let's talk about like, what are the challenges of um, engaging in more of a transactional volunteer culture? If we, you know, cause I think sometimes these things just like happen by accident. Like I, you know, I think all of us have the best of intentions um, and, and we become, you know, you're trying to be all things to all people. And then unintentionally as you're growing your program or trying to implement more programming in the community, you know, it can just get to this place where it's like, we've just got to get these things done. What, what might happen if you're feeling um, transactional, you know, your volunteers are feeling transactional, even if we're not articulating that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, the one that really shows up a lot uh, in our work is um, that lack of commitment or lower volunteer uh, performance just because, simply because if the volunteer doesn't feel like what they're doing is important or they don't think that anyone will notice if they don't show up, then that's automatically going to be an easy way to kind of back out. If no one knows your name, they don't really, you know, you show up and you don't really feel like you're part of a community, then it's going to be easy to just call in right before you're supposed to be there and say, you know what? I have some things that came up. I really can't be there today. Well, that puts you in a bind as a as a volunteer leader because you were counting on that person. And so sometimes uh, in our efforts to just get things done, we sometimes miss the fact that um, see the perspective of the volunteer who's like, well, I don't really feel like what I'm doing is all that important. They'll get 20 other people there today, so they're not going to miss me. Um, and we, we certainly don't want... Uh, any volunteer to feel that way. Sometimes it kind of does happen and we don't intend that to happen. But um, but by having even just little touch points that have uh, those personal connections to them, you can, you can immediately see a shift in the volunteer's attitude toward uh, the work and their willingness to be there and be committed to that work. And even get other people involved with it. Yep. Um, a lot of times if they go and sometimes, you know, people just happen to volunteer and just show up to try it out. And then they feel like they've really connected or um, it's been an amazing experience. They're going to go tell their friends and then that can also help bring in. But when you have that transactional um, culture, which again, it's, it's easy to fall into. Cause like you said, you just get so busy and you got to get stuff done. Um, but the, it, the volunteers can feel that. Um, and I've seen volunteers show up to stuff envelopes and they are happy as they can be because they feel that, you know, so-and-so knows my name and I'm, you know, I know what's happening. I, I know the mission of this organization and I've seen the impact. So I will do whatever you want because I feel connected. And, and when you don't have that connection, when it's more transactional, you kind of see this, well, they might not need me today or, you know, oh, they just had me stuffing envelopes today and not really getting the bigger vision of, you know, why that's really important. This is a small job, but it's really important. So. It's yeah. So interesting when we came across recently where they were talking about 10 was their kind of number. So 10 transactions. And after that 10, they got a diminishing return. It was getting you know, sloppier, this, that, and the other. And they found the same thing that you ladies are describing is unless they brought back this touch point of community around the task so that they felt like they were coming into a community. And then having that moment when they're hitting those 10 markers of whatever that task is to have a participant come join that tells what their service means to them. So they're seeing an end recipient. So I think it's just very each program is different. I think we've got a widespread here today, but it's figuring out from your kind of quantitative, as you said, at Laurel measurements, mm -hmm. when do you hit that point where you've got to build the program to have those touch points or it will become too transactional and that relationship might need to happen after three times with your program or the first time with your program. And then knowing that is so important for that feedback loop. But yeah, yeah. love what you guys are sharing. And like you said, there's we've seen organizations here today that are from the like the broadest spectrum I think we've ever seen, which is so fantastic. So, you know, um, it really comes down to your organization and knowing your organization and the vision that you want to have and the goals that you want to have for your volunteer program, because that could look different for from organization to organization. So, yeah, we've yeah. we've. We've got a, a question that talks about um, 
from one of our managers here in the in the question, um, just like dealing with um, parents in crisis and their te teens and relying on volunteers to maintain the day-to-day -day functions of the organization. And many of the members are also in crisis. So um, mm -hmm. even though they, they try to remind them helping others can give you a break from your own crisis and can be fulfilling, sometimes they struggle with getting um, people involved and giving back or the core group is getting really burned out. So um, some suggestions on motivational techniques to get more people involved. I think that some of that um, will come up in, in some more of our conversation. Um, but I think that that's a real challenge that, uh, you know, actually a lot of organizations are mm -hmm. facing. Um, and, you know, I really like this first one here when we're thinking about the benefits of like creating community ambassadors. I, I would say like, how could we take this core group and maybe um, find a way to get them to, you know, actually find more people. I don't know if that's something that you all have seen be successful in more of this relationship-based culture, like getting them to build more relationships and bringing people in maybe. Yes. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 We do see that. We do see that a lot. When you do have a group of engaged volunteers who understand the mission, care very deeply about the mission, feel like they are uh, part of the solution to the issue that they're addressing at their nonprofit, then they are much more likely to share that information with their friends, colleagues, family, networks, etc. And that is where you get that um, uh, concentric circle activity. So you have you have people who are your inner core that are working with you, and they're feeling overwhelmed. But perhaps you need to take a moment to have them remember the meaning behind what they're doing. Once they take a moment to show that that gratitude and their experience um, and how they've been able to help other people, then they will be they will be re-energized and inspired to share that outside of uh, just their kind of closed door maybe environment. Um, but we we do see that happen a lot. We really love to see that when volunteers take it uh, to the next level, when they're just so excited about what you're doing at the organization and their part in it, that they just want to tell everybody about it. It's really inspiring. Yeah, I like this here on the benefits of just really creating more opportunities that they can share. Um, I think that's one thing that I've noticed, especially when when volunteer burnout can be present, which we do have some resources on our blog about volunteer burnout and how to recognize the signs before it happens um, and to start implementing some other ways that they could um, you know, word of mouth recruitment, kind of get other people involved or, you know, take a breather um, as well, because, you know, that is part of maintaining a relationship is kind of, you know, how do we stay in tune with each other um, and, you know, as employees and then also the volunteer group. Um, that's part of relationship is, is finding that way. It's tricky when we have so much to get done and we're working in um, potentially like pretty intense and serious environments. Mm -hmm. Um, I know, Laurel, that you have some experience in that um, in that field as well. And so, um, yeah, I know that that's that's pretty that's pretty serious. Is there anything more that you'd like to add um, before we sort of move on to really defining, you know, what is the difference between relational and transactional? Um, I just Laurel, when she was speaking, it made me think of an experience that I had with an organization that I volunteered with um, and one thing that they have really as an organization taken on is mindfulness and creating space to be able to like, I'm, I'm burning out. I am burnt out. I need some, something. And so they have really in, incorporated a lot of um, mental health practices, yoga, med meditation, um, things like that, just within their own organization. But then they have also opened that up to the volunteers um, and, and given them the opportunity to come in and say, you know, we're going to have during the month of May on Wednesdays at this time, we're going to have an hour long yoga section session and mindfulness session if you want to come and join. And so it's the staff, it's the volunteers, and they're able to actually unplug and they're not working, they're not volunteering. And it's, it's just an intentional space to, to, to breathe and to, um, you know, take, take that break and kind of refresh a little bit. So that just her talking about it kind of made me think of that as like an example of one way that they're, the organization is prioritizing that and involving the volunteers within it, because 
they're involved in the hard work too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're so right about that. And that is such a great example of, of creating a relational culture because it's like, I value you beyond um, you being just showing up for your shift, you know? And I, I love that because, um, you know, for me, I can have a tendency and perhaps others can relate to jam packed packing my schedule so full that I might not take a mindfulness moment, but if I'm showing up to volunteer somewhere and they're offering it to me, I'm probably going to be pretty grateful (laughs) that it, that it exists and that they, they thought about me maybe even when I wasn't thinking about me. So that's a really creative, uh, relational culture idea. Um, that's, that's really great. So let's talk a little bit about some just questions to consider. Um, and these would be great ones to maybe answer, in the chat, what, what do we think about the difference between transactional versus relational? You know, what words would you use to describe Dana and Laurel? You, you shared some stuff, some really great descriptive words the other day that really made a lot of sense. Um, but we'd love for others to join in as well. Tell us what, what these are. Yeah. Yeah. We would love to see in the chat from all of you, what words come to mind, but it, you know, when you think about a transactional volunteer culture, what the word that comes to mind for me is kind of one-off or, um, uh, I don't know, standardized, you know, just something that's just kind of, this is just something that needs to get accomplished. Um, and, and so we, when, once you articulate that and write that down, you're like, oh, that's not really the culture that I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, there's some really great ones showing up in the chat, obligation rather than opportunity, Uh, Mm -hmm. a cookie cutter approach. Like we just need you to just fill this spot, come on in um, and leave. Thank you for your service. See you later kind of thing. Um, But that was, yeah just a number, just a number. And that, uh, that never feels very val- valuable. Um, there is kind of a, I think, I also don't want to be so hard on numbers, because there are many of you who do work that requires a lot of hands. And so I, I please don't hear that what we're saying is that having a large group of people is not um you can't have a relational volunteer culture in a group that has a lot of people. What what I think we're trying to say is how do we find ways to build community within that large group of people? So if there is a large task that needs to be done, how do we ensure that that large group of people feels connected to one another and that they uh, are able to accomplish the goal in the time that they have allotted to them? And similarly, what is what does the the relational culture look like? What are some words that come to mind when you think about shifting that? Um, the the best word that comes to mind for me is empowering, because it's empowering not only to the leader who's coordinating all of this, but it's also empowering for the volunteer who's who's participating. So what kind of what kind of words come to mind? Oh, gratitude. There's some great ones showing up in the yeah. United accountability. That's a great one, especially when you're dealing with a large group and people can feel just like a number. Um, if there's, if there's community amongst that volunteer group, then they, then their friends and colleagues are like, oh, where is that person today? I was really hoping to see them. You know what? I have their cell phone number. I'm going to, I'll text them and just see how they're doing make sure they're okay. Or like, you know, are you sick? Did something come up? Just wanted to check on you kind of thing that changes the game for a volunteer who maybe felt like they were not really of any value. Um, belonging. Oh, what a perfect word. Perfect word for a relational culture. I like uh, people who volunteer in a relational culture may not even consider it volunteering. And I think that that is totally true. um, Very true. Very true. Very true. Yeah. Very true. These are great. Go ahead. I was going to say, I heard somebody say uh, in the last year, and I I wish I could remember who said it, but somebody said, you know, volunteerism is just formalized community. Like we're just trying to organize um, being community for one another. And that really stuck with me because you're right. Like when, you know, when you feel like that sense of relational culture, it's like, I guess I'm volunteering, but I just want to show up. And um, (laughs) it does feel, it does feel really 
different uh, for sure. So, well, and if you think about the work that people are doing in nonprofits, by nature, it's relational. You you are a nonprofit, whatever sector that is of nonprofit, you're in it because you care about something and that you're very deeply passionate about that. And so um, I think by nature, nonprofits are are relational, but can get caught up in the transactional of like, we got to get all these things done, um, you know, and just because of the workload, there is so much to do in nonprofit. Um, it can easily lean towards transactional by default and not even, you know, not even on purpose, but um, yeah, I think by nature, nonprofit is built for relationships. We've got some fun questions that are kind of stacking up here. So I'll um, I'll let you all kind of go ahead here and we'll start diving into some of these tools and practices. We've got a few slides here to talk about all the different ways that we can start to try and define and build um, and nurture that relational uh, culture within the volunteer programs. And probably along the way, I'll pop pop some, some of these questions over to you as well. But just want to go ahead and pitch it over to you, uh, Laurel and Dana. Sure, sure. So these are all going to be in your toolkit as well that uh, is being prepared for you all. But these are just some key areas that are uh, places to start and what what your relational culture practices need to look like. Uh, the first and foremost one is get to know your volunteers. Uh, we want to know what are their personalities, what's their dislikes. You may find that they have a skill that you didn't even realize that they have that could be really helpful to your work but because they you know have a particular job title you just kind of assume that they this is just what they do um, but getting to know them you really find a, a lot more about a person and what they bring to the table um, communication obviously is key and I'm sure that you all have heard many a session on how to communicate with volunteers but one in one situation that we we uh, found recently was a, a volunteer um, who is there regularly, committed there every week, um, knows the, the clients and the organization very well, but didn't realize that something big at the organization had happened. And so they were kind of caught off guard. Like I'm here every day or I'm here every week working, but I didn't realize that we were shifting this in entire program. I had to find out while I was at my shift. So trying to find ways. So that's that's when the keep them in the know that we have, have included here is because they are committed, you need to treat them um, as kind of an insider circle. Because as an ambassador, when they're speaking to the community about your, your work, they need to be aware of things that maybe are shifts in your culture or major staffing changes and leadership and things like that, just mm -hmm. so that so that they feel like they can um, speak about that work in a in an informed way. Uh, there's lots of different ways that you can show volunteer impact. Um, Dana has one example that I think is a really good one. Dana, do you want to share about the the um, email that shows the impact monthly? Sure. So uh, an organization that I know of. Um, anytime someone comes to volunteer, they have just like a little check-in. And so you, you know, do the QR code, check in, um, tell them how many hours you're going to be there or how long you're going to be. Um, and they're able to take that information and populate it. And so about every month they send out an email to, to all the volunteers that say, you know, we are so grateful for your time. Thanks to you. This many hours were volunteered and that translates to this many uh, grant dollars that we will receive, or you know, they put a number on it. So here's how many people volunteered. Here's the hours, and so you get to, you, you're just one person, but going and seeing, oh my gosh, there was like fifteen thousand hours that was volunteered last month by, you know, however many people. It's it's it is you're part of you're one person, but you're part of this bigger thing, and then you get to see um, the financial impact that it has for the organization, whether it's through grants or dollars saved or whatever. Um, so I thought that was really, really cool that they, um, you know, it is another lift for sure. Um, but 
it it is seems to be relatively easy for them to to put that information together and then communicate it out and it's just one more little piece um of of be of communicating with volunteers and letting them know that the the impact that they have singularly and as a a, a group the impact that they're making absolutely thanks yeah. Dana. I was going to say that speaks to having a really organized uh, yes. system because yeah, if, yes. you're not, if you're not counting it, you can't really acknowledge people for what they're doing and you can't right. you know, make those measurements. And so that's kind of where this like funny balance of like, it's relational, but I also have to count things so that I can right. make the relationship. <laughs> yeah. you know? um, so just kind of having those things squared away makes it easier to share volunteer impact, makes it easier, especially with like a large number of volunteers. Cause this yeah. has like a ton of volunteers, they um, do. Yeah. which I have my chapstick here, by the way, this will <laughs> um, Excellent. Yeah. But, you know, to be able to do that, you know, cause we've got folks that have like a thousand volunteers and you know, how, how do you get to know them? How do you make them feel like they're in um, you know, a relationship when, when potentially, and this is one of our questions, like how, you know, how do you do that when some of the volunteerism is sporadic and episodic? And would you say that, you know, acknowledging people in that way is, is helpful for building the relationship? Uh, I think it absolutely is. I think that, um, it may turn that episodic relationship into something that's more regular because if they see the value of their time and how if they're not there that is that is time that's that's not able to be reported as a potential uh, value add to the organization as well so i do think that that um even if it's even if it is episodic, making sure that that person understands like, hey, we understand that you're really busy. Maybe you can't be here on a weekly basis, but we just want you to know that even the amount of time that you have given to us by volunteering or providing this service to us has really been impactful. And you're part of this overall impact measurement that is being shared. So it really does take those that are regular as well as those that are episodic and it does play into how you can build relationship with them for sure. And if I can just add one more thing to those volunteers, they're out in the community, you know, they have their own jobs, their own friend circle, fam all that. And so if they have, if they feel that they're a part of this and they're excited, they're going to take that out to the community. And I mean, that to me just is, is so, so important for awareness. And if you're, even if you're a smaller organization and you're trying to get more volunteers in, or you're trying to increase your presence in the community um, by having that, you know, it's just really, I think it, 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 it lets the community also have, have, it, it projects an image to the community and might want to get more people involved from the community as well. Yeah. And I think that's another point to that, you know, that last slide, that last point is like, think of different ways for volunteers to get involved. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think there's some great stuff happening in the chat. It's like, you could have a little volunteer cohort conversation and you mm -hmm. can ask them, what would make you feel more connected? Um, mm -hmm. because when you ask those like open-ended questions that aren't so much yes, no, mm -hmm. you just like open up the world of creativity and like, what are these folks going to say? And that's, you know, if, if you're willing to listen and you're, and you're able to give, you know, an hour um, here and there to that conversation and really open the door to it. Um, some of your, I, I always call it like mining for gold. So like some of your best little nuggets of wisdom are going to come straight from the people who are there. Um, you know, I know that we had someone asking about like, we've got these high schoolers and they're coming and they're, they've got to get these hours for school and they're doing kind of monotonous work. Like how, do, how could I potentially like, you know, get them involved to want to come back more when it's not required? Um, mm -hmm. And I think, you know, I guess I would say like, what are some ideas that you have there when it's a work like that, where it's like a job, you know, it's a requirement of their school graduation. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can speak to that ad nauseum since I was the person in high school who did all the volunteer hours. And, uh, but I will say that, um, that the volunteer managers are even those volunteer leaders, um, 
who were volunteers themselves, but they were coordinating a group of volunteers. They were so impactful in my life because they got me excited about the work we were doing. They always helped me connect it back to the mission. So rather than it just being, you know, yes, we know you're here to sign off these forms or whatever, but while they had me in the room, they said, you know, we're going to teach these kids about this, or we're going to do this and, and look at their faces once they have had a light bulb moment, because now they understand something differently that they didn't understand before, or, or the craft that we made together, it like, it opened up something for them that, that they didn't experience before now. So I think that the leadership, um, staff and volunteer really investing in kids and building those relationships is what inspired me to continue my work in nonprofit um, uh, management, even to this day. So they set the tone. So I think that even if it is high schoolers, you may not realize the seeds that you're planting with a 15 year old or a 17 year old who at the time is like, I just want to go play video games. Can we hurry this up? Um, you may not know what's sticking in those conversations. So I would say always have a like a mentorship mindset and just trust the fact that you're planting seeds that are going to show up later on in lots of different ways. Yeah, that's great. And so if you want to go ahead and, oh, sorry, go ahead, Elizabeth. What are you yeah, gonna say? I was just curious, um, any tactics there? Because I think we're seeing mentorship mentioned, buddy systems, pairing yeah. experience yeah. with new. Um, but I also feel like there's this moment where you sometimes don't talk about that people need to practice that. Like yes. a volunteer that's not going to be a mentor, a volunteer that's going to be an ambassador. Like we have to come together and be like, okay, we're going to practice. Describe what our nonprofit does and why it matters to you. And pr- let them kind of get comfortable saying it to you before or you're asking them to go say it to someone else because I think that you can 100%. That. I think that tactic is often we skip it we tell them to go do the thing but we don't let them practice so they feel comfortable in ownership and it's not their story so they don't tell it naturally so I, I love right. that idea of of drawing more out from these cohorts from this feedback because yeah. then you're hearing their stories firsthand you might be capturing that to use in these updates and these newsletters but you're also getting them very comfortable saying like okay i can put this on facebook you know someone said yeah. earlier how do you how do you spread a word well i'm not going to spread word if it's just a you know boring stat but if it's a yeah. picture of me doing something that i cared about and i have a story and i know how to tell people about it then that's something I do feel comfortable sharing. So I yeah, wanted yeah. anything you've seen there or anything I may have said too much, but <laughs> no, <laughs> it's good. perfect. It's perfect. I I was just gonna say we are huge fans of role playing. We do mm-hmm. it with all of our clients, um, uh, boards especially. You would you would be shocked. Um, actually, probably the volunteer manager managers would not be shocked by this, but Mm -hmm. so many board members, when we ask them to talk about the mission of the organization and say, why are you involved in this? What is it that is so wonderful about this group? How would you describe it to someone if you were just sitting, having a cup of coffee? And it is, uh, it's fascinating how some board members are like, well, I don't really know why I do this, but I'm, I'm here. Or you get the opposite, which is somebody shares, this is why this work is so important to me. I had a sister who had this health condition and and it really impacted our family. And as a result, I volunteer with this group because I want to help other families who have uh, who are touched by this particular illness or condition, et cetera. You may you never know that those things are under the surface unless you sit in that environment and invite them to do that role play exercise. Just tell me. And it goes back to the the um, feedback group that court mentioned earlier like like when you get people in a room you ask open-ended questions you you find out a lot of things that are a connection point that you wouldn't have realized otherwise and it gives that volunteer a chance to practice it and use the words in their own vernacular in their own way and not memorizing a mission statement but just saying this is what this organization does and I am involved in it because, and then leave it, leave it, let the conversation go from there. It's yeah. very, very powerful. I think what you just said really had me 
wanting to articulate. And I think that this, this question is coming up a lot, in the, a lot, I think in our chat, but also, you know, it's come up a lot in different organizations that I've worked in, in the volunteer culture is that your, your version of a relational volunteer culture is going to be unique to the people that make it up. Just like any relationships or you un are unique and any sort of team or organization has its own personality and its own. And so what makes your volunteers feel connected is going to be different from another program. And so like the strategies that maybe work for one organization or one program might not work for yours. And so that's where I think that the power of that conversation and kind of, you know, that's that first step. Um, Cause I've been in situations where, you know, um, people thought, oh, this is what they want, but no one ever asked. Mm -hmm. And, and so I was like, you know, and I've told Elizabeth this many times, like I do not want to be recognized on a stage that doesn't make me feel great. And yet that has kind of, you know, happened, <laughs> and, you know, but what I really love is, you know, when I think about this, like how to make volunteers feel appreciated, this one at the very bottom jumped out to me um, from Laurel and Dana about like getting input on a pilot program or a new program or new creative ideas that really got my juices flowing. And that would, those are the kind of things that make me feel really connected to programs that I'm working with um, versus, you know, I, I don't necessarily need a, a ceremony. Now somebody else might really like that. And so I think that that's a little bit where like appreciation, you know, kind of keeping notes on volunteer appreciation and how volunteers like to be recognized that can be helpful. But I think keeping notes on that and keeping track of that is also what builds relationships, right? It's kind of like, you know, the love languages of volunteerism, like, you know, we don't <laughs> want to give people gifts if what they really want is to share their insights on a program, right? right. Um, so I just feel like it's very important to know that it's not going to look the same. Um, yeah, and that feels really important to just know for all of us and, and to feel good about actually. And if I could also add one more thing to that is, you know, over time, things are going to change. And so, you know, one thing I've seen some organizations do um, was every five years or what, you know, however many years they kind of go back and look at their volunteer program. They look at what they're doing um, and they're like, do we need to adjust this? Do we need to update it? Is, you know, have times changed or is this still a good way to get people involved or do we need to think of something else? And then that's where the the feedback from the volunteers and and having that relationship with them can kind of inform like, do we need to adjust some things and and pivot a little bit or is it is it we still got a good thing going you know it's you got to kind of still innovate in a way um and that communication with the volunteers is going to really really help that absolutely i i do want to share one example i had a a woman call me recently and said i i volunteer for this organization i love them so much um I am a retired business owner and I just feel like the different volunteer opportunities that they have available to me are not really using my skill sets to their fullest capacity. And so I, they don't have a very robust um, fundraising program. So I would like to learn how to write grants so that I can help them raise funds. Um, and so I'd like to talk with you about, you know, what's the best way to get the training I need to help people uh, further in their fundraising and development as a volunteer. And I just had to stop and say, well, first of all, thank you for thinking creatively about how you could help this organization. And she worked with them on that and said, and they were so grateful to have her share that different skill set. Um, and, and they were able to kind of work out some ways and help her get trained and, and use her in different ways. So I think that it's just a great example of, of, of how um, you have to be creative and think outside the box so that you can find different ways to engage your volunteers and use them for specific uh, areas that you wouldn't otherwise even think of or realize that it are a possibility. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I know we've got, we've got some folks, um, we've got, I want to make sure we save a little bit of time for questions at the end, because we've got so many great questions happening right now. And I want to get to as many of them as we possibly can. 
Sure. Um, but let's just talk about, you know, what if we were to break this down into a three-step process here? Like, so starting off with assessing where you're at in, in terms of your volunteer culture and, and where you want to go, creating a vision. One, how can you frame these conversations with volunteers so that it doesn't become something where it's just like, this needs to be fixed and we want to complain about this. Like, how do you frame the conversation so that you can have like a, a productive conversation? And then also, how do you create that vision, um, you know, hopefully collaboratively with your volunteers on how that culture is developed? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, definitely decide your questions before you invite any uh, volunteer <laughs> feedback, for sure. Um, identify, you know, four or five questions that you want to find out from them and their perspective on, you know, and really lead with the positives. Just say, what is it that you love about working with our organization? You know, and and what types of communication do you really appreciate? And I really, really, truly believe in these um, open ended kind of conversations. And so that so that things don't feel like just a checkbox, like, do you want us to use email versus text message reminders? That's not really what we're talking about here. And you might have to use um, uh, some kind of small groups of of a variety of people who maybe represent different age groups or um, racial and ethnic backgrounds and things so that you're asking the same set of questions from a variety of people so that you can kind of find out um, what, because it, it's going to be different for each of them. So I do think defining what your questions are going to be um, before you start this process so that you have consistent uh, responses to look at and then really taking the time to um, a, taking a pause, honestly, to just for a half a day, perhaps just sit there and say, okay, let's decide what is this vision that we want to have for our volunteer program? What do we want it to look like? What do we want it to feel like? What, how do we want our, our volunteers to interact with one another? Jot that down and invite a small number of volunteers to participate with you in that process and map it out. And and then and then you can kind of go from there. You'll those those paths will reveal themselves to you as you're doing that process. And you can co-create it with a small group of leaders. And that it's informed by the the interviews and the surveys that you've collected from other volunteers. But definitely define the process before you dive into it because it very well could turn into a list of of, you know, I don't like this and I don't like this. But if you kind of create that structure in advance, then you'll be set up for success for sure. And when it comes to some of these processes and tools that you really need to have in place to support this vision, you know, what are the things on this list here that you feel like are pretty important for uh, volunteer programs to, to really take the time to invest in? Yes, definitely a volunteer management system because as we've talked about, you can't you can't articulate impact if you're if you don't have all of that information compiled in one place. Um, you definitely need to have these these um, personal communications for sure, and then be able to to explain to your volunteers the value of what they're doing for you, uh, and keeping that forefront of everything that you do. Um, all right. So what are we hoping that we're going to see happen um, from, you know, really investing in, in nurturing this culture? Um, again, that will be unique to, to your organization. And then potentially if you're a really large organization with a diverse amount of programming, each programming and each team might also have a sort of a unique culture, um, which I think speaks to some of what um, has been mentioned. I know Elizabeth mentioned this earlier, but having, you know, a volunteer who's also a leader within their team, uh, maybe a senior volunteer, um, but really hoping to see that increased long-term commitment. That's what I think everyone's hoping for. Um, volunteer engagement. I know Elizabeth and AK hear about that a lot from our Get Connected Network. That's what we're working on a lot with our clients, just a lot of volunteer engagement and, you know, some of that cross-pollination that Dana and Laurel are talking about. 
um, you know, across the organization, which I really love that holistic view, um, and just increase community awareness opportunities and um, financial contributions. Um, so that's what we're hoping to see. So we'll kind of land here. Um, this bonus take action, these three points, that's what your planning guide that we're going to deliver to you on Monday is going to include. So include some really great questions on how to assess and evaluate your volunteer culture. Um, some of these things that we talked about, like, and, and Laurel and Dana, I know you spoke to us the other day about the combination of a volunteer survey and a live interview as being necessary. You can't really do just one or the other. And we've sort of mentioned both of those things during this time. Um, but I felt like just the way that you articulated how both are important because you need um, both of those data points. I don't know if there's anything additional you want to say about that. Yeah, I think that um, especially groups that have large numbers of volunteers, like we understand there's no way you could take a thousand people out for coffee and get individual feedback from every one of them. We get that. Um, there is a bit of an art to uh, identifying 20, 25 people from your volunteer roster and say, I want to have conversations with these people. These are going to be some one-on-one -on -one conversations. And you do want to get those different perspectives um, because if you get the same, uh, you know, person or type of person in that your, your results are going to be skewed. So getting a sampling of people from your volunteer pool, people who are really engaged, and then people who've only been to a couple of volunteer events. You want that as well. Um, somebody who's only been involved for the past six months versus somebody who's been involved for 12 years. Like you want to have a, a, a list of people who represent um, a variety of experiences and then you can capture that large group. We can all do an online survey. You can send it to thousands of people. It's free. You'll get, you know, hopefully a 15% response rate. But what we often see is that the connection between those in-person interviews is usually um, supported by the results we get from the online survey. So it just adds adds weight to the results that you gathered from those in-person interviews, because then you can see the numbers of, oh, actually, there's a lot of people who feel that way. Um, even though we didn't have coffee with each of them, we found that out from the online survey results. Yeah. And these last two points before um, we take the last like eight minutes to do some Q&A here, um, I just I really wanted Dana to get a chance to tell the story that you shared with us the other day, um, because I'm thinking about boosting volunteer communications, employing tools and processes that support nurturing relational volunteer culture. I just felt like what happened to you when you didn't know where to go. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> was like really a great compelling story for why these two things are so important to take action on. If you don't mind to share that in about a minute or so. Yeah, sure. So um, I, I, I received, I signed up to be a volunteer for this particular organization and they were having a couple, a lot of calls to action of, you know, we got to be here at this time. We need volunteers to show up and lend their voice. Uh, so I signed up and they were actually very organized on the front end, um, you know, gave maps and times and shifts and all of these things. So I was like, okay, this is great. I've got all the information I need. Well, I show up to the location and I can't find anybody. Like they said there was going to be a volunteer table. I, I walked around the entire building. I couldn't find it. I happened to run into some other people who were volunteering and they had a similar experience and, you know, had I not been so passionate about the organization and the purpose for being there, I probably would have gone home because I couldn't figure out, you know, they said there was going to be a volunteer table or someone to connect with to tell me where to go. I couldn't find anybody. So I kind of just made my way around and figured it out on my own, connected with some other volunteers. But it was such a, a contrast from the communication I had received on the front end to the actual on-site opportunity. It was like night and day. Um, and that was just kind of a bummer because, uh, you know, it's ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> I've so. been in that situation myself as well. And it's like one of those things where part, I feel like part of this is also the relational culture is like finding, um, and Elizabeth talks a lot about this, like, you know, cycles of iteration and improvement. We're not going to, none of us are going to get this right every right. time, the first right. time. But 
taking a moment and going, oh, like 50% of our volunteers couldn't find where to go. Okay, next time we'll like improve this. Um, that takes a little bit of the pressure off of us because we know we can't do it right every time. Um, and I'll have here in the last like five minutes, I'll have AK start dropping some links about how to connect with us while we answer these questions and also how to um, keep in touch with Dana and Laurel. Um, so we'll make sure all of those links are getting dropped in the chat as well as how to get on our blog and our learning center and check out all of these resources. So let's try and pitch through a couple of these questions here in about five minutes. Um, so here's one. We always try to schedule extra volunteers because we often have last minute cancellations. However, this often leads to having too many people for a shift and they don't feel like they were needed. Um, so how do you find a balance between making them feel important and not putting um, putting the organization in a bind? So mm. maybe it can create like doing something that's trying to kind of cover the shift, but occasionally it can wind up creating some uncomfortable feelings. Um how would you handle that in a relational culture sort of way? Yeah. If this is happening over and over again, then I say you have a really committed group of volunteers and you probably don't need to overbook as much as you think you do. Um, so maybe just kind of lowering the overbooking of, you know, instead of maybe having five extra people, maybe make spots for two extra people because um, you can usually uh, you see patterns in in behavior or in um, different volunteer activities so if this is a consistent issue that comes up then perhaps you don't ne maybe need that extra buffer um, and so I say just keep adjusting until you get the right mix and you're you're kind of in a good rhythm there yeah um, I mean I would also add just one of the organizations I've worked with, it's part of their communication. Um, they let us know that, you know, we've got this many volunteers. We do have a few extras and, and they make sure that people know that there's just going to be times where, you know, we have a few extra volunteers um, be, in the case that some people can't make it. And um, they always say, we'll try to communicate with you before you show up to let you know, but sometimes it's not always possible. But at least for me with this organization, they have they have already kind of made it known that like that it's it could be part of of the process is that they just might and so you know i know that i'm committed on certain days um and if there's extra people you know that's okay so it's it may be a little bit different attitude i guess that the the organization has kind of said you know look we value volunteers and we uh, we know people's schedules change. And so we usually have a couple extra people. And sometimes when I show up and they've got too many people, um, you know, I can, I can go home or whatever, you know, but again, I think it is the organization that has communicated that and kind of let it be known that you are valuable, um, you know, but we, we do just in case people can't make it, we do have extras that, that are committed to showing up too. That transparency is so key because I think even the reverse, there's not enough people there being transparent that you're my inner circle of volunteers and I don't have enough of you. How can we brainstorm together to get more people tomorrow so that it isn't this hard on the three that showed when we needed five? Yeah, I think that that vice versa, the communication so that they feel like they're helping you with the solution and not just not understanding why you schedule so poorly. I think that's that's so important. And they, I've also seen them to, you know, try to create more of a open communication. If you know, for some reason you cannot make it tomorrow, please let me know. And, and, you know, stuff happens last minute. I get that, but kind of allowing the volunteers to be able to say, Hey, something came up and I just can't make it. And so then you kind of, um, have that communication again, communication kind of on the front end. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm always a fan of, of communicating and I'm always a fan of a backup project, but that comes from my years of working with uh, students. So I always had the <laughs> primary project and a backup project waiting just in case any, any idle hands were happening. Um, so here's, here's an interesting thing. How does a relational volunteer culture increase volunteer recruitment? Oh, that's, that's huge. I should let Dana take that one for sure. <laughs> Uh, I'll just give a quick example. So an organization that I volunteer with, um, I regular, like I have a great experience 
And I tell all my friends, I tell all my, the people that I work with, um, I post it on social media it, it, because it's an environment that I can do that. Not all of them can, you can do that. I understand. So, um, you know, it is out, I put it out there about how much I love it and the, all of that stuff. And I've had no less than like 10 people come to me and say, I want to volunteer here. How do I get involved? And, and it's all because of my experience that I, that, that the organization, you know, that I have with them and the excitement I have, I'm putting it out there into the community with my friends and my family who trust what I have to say. Um, and then they're like, well, I want to, I want to donate. I want to get involved. I want to support, I want to come to an event. Um, you know, and so that's it. I think it's huge. I think it is huge to the growth. I've seen so many people become volunteers themselves. I, I know people who have become donors because of it. Um, and so I think it is, is the volunteers are your community mouth, mouthpiece. They're out there in the community and they're representing you. Um, well, I want to say that, first of all, uh, it's 1.59 uh, Eastern Standard Time, and I wish we could keep staying on with <laughs> Laurel and Dana and Elizabeth and AK and every single uh, volunteer leader that's here. There are um, some amazing questions. We we have a lot of resources in our learning center at galaxydigital.com slash blog that you can check out. Um, lots of questions about communications, volunteer survey questions, um, word of mouth, uh, recruitment, social media. We've got resources on all of these things. And I would love for you to spend some time there. I wish we could stay on all afternoon because volunteer leaders are the coolest. And we're so grateful for you all taking the time today. Grateful to AK and Elizabeth from our team. Grateful to Laurel and Dana of Fisher Story Consulting. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and just again, and who are we? Why are we here? Um, well, I'm Court from Get Connected by Galaxy Digital, and we actually make up a network of about 54,000 actually now nonprofits and over 2 million volunteers. Um, we make volunteer management technology solutions for every organization, program size, and budget. So if that is something that you need to support your volunteer relationships, please reach out to us at info at galaxydigital.com, or you can head to galaxydigital.com and just request a demo and chat with one of our awesome um, technology experts who can consult with you about what might be best for your program. Um, again, so grateful you were here. We will send out the recording on Monday. If you need more support, please check out our blog. We have so many resources for you and a huge thank you to the entire team um, being present today. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Y'all have so many great resources. Like, I'm just watching in the chat, like, somebody makes a comment or ask a question. Oh, we got a thing for that. We got a thing for that. We do. Oh, we do. Amazing. I'll make sure to send that to y'all, too. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow up with both of you soon. So, um, all right so much. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank, Thank you guys. <laughs> You're amazing. Bye. Bye.